Pen and ink, pen and ink. Someone find me a pen and some ink. Quick, quick now. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, thank goodness. Which was it? Startled me. I didn't realize I had guests. Uh, where did you come from? How did you get yeah, in anyway? Uh, Sally, uh, bring, bring tea, tea for her. Company. Never mind. I don't think we have enough. enough. Uh, forgive my, forgive my, my, uh, my frenzy, but uh, the Lord gave me a hymn when I was on the road, and uh, I was afraid it would fly out of my head before I, I could write it down. Um, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Excuse me. I'm a musician. <laughs> you know how they are. Mm. Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, Charles. We've been waiting for you to come home. Oh, yes. We were wondering, well, how many hymns have you written? Oh, I guess they were called. Um, 6,000 6, lots. I wrote many of them, uh, inspired by the trauma that my brother John and I faced. Traveling together on the road, I'm a rich and awesome people. Let me tell you about the case of this one. I was just preaching to some Irishmen. They were reasonably calm until I informed them they needed a savior. They took offense and started toward me. I ran and hid in a barn, scared. Uh, there I was trembling in fear, but the strangest thing happened next. A tiny bird pursued by a hawk. Darted in and lodged here beneath my cloak. There we were, both of us, fleeing predators and, and trembling in the uh, It brought to mind that terrifying storm on the ship to America to Savannah years ago. My brother and I were invited by General Oglethorpe to be missionaries to the colonists and the Indians in America. However, at the time, no one had bothered to convert us. We were very familiar with the Book of Common Prayer, but unfamiliar with the power of heaven. In the middle of the ocean, a storm struck. John and I were terrified. We thought we would surely drown. Uh, how, John cried, how can I call myself a Christian if I'm afraid to die? Um, but we were on, on that boat, we met a group of Christians. They were called Moravians, and they were not afraid at all. While we trembled in fear, they calmly sang hymns. Even their children played on deck as it was on a calm summer day. We knew not how. Once the storm calmed, we were safe. John asked one of the Moravians uh, if they were not afraid to die. He looked at him strangely and said, Of course not. He said, We have an assurance of salvation. And um, John and I, neither of us knew what he meant. In any case, um, hear my words. And, uh, this was the impression upon my heart. Read ten minutes of the Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Oh no. Wait, let me finish. Why the near waters roll? While the tempest still is high, hiding before my Savior mind, tell the storm of life is past, saying to the heathen guide, Oh, receive my soul in the past. Yeah, what do you think? Well, I'm 
Charles, Charles, it seems luscious. Luscious? You disapprove. Sorry, Charlie. Nay, the last John's impression was the same. Luscious, amorous. John told me that when expressing love for the Almighty, it is possible to step over the line into the realm of unfamiliarity. <laughs> um, but but uh, I told him that our proud church is already so unfamiliar with its creator that we are barely nodding acquaintances. John feared that such language would stir up our enemies, enemies uh, who were constantly accusing us of providing religious uh, fervor. I told, I told him that I would require the blessing of our enemies before writing hymns. I should never write another. Well, in any way, you be the judge. Let me see. Jesus, the love of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll. While the tempest still is nigh, I leave, O oh my Savior, hide Till the storm of life is past, Save to the haven guide, O oh, is he my soul at last. Sing with me now. Other refuge have I none, Hangs my helpless soul on me. Leave, ah, leave me not alone. Still support and comfort me. All my hope in thee is day. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wings. Let just grace with me is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, stay and keep me pure within. Now of life the fountain of heart, freely let me take a bee. Spring now up within my heart, rise to all eternity. Yeah, John thought it a bit dark and luscious, but he confessed I finally won him over. <laughs> that tempest on the voyage to Georgia was a gentle breeze compared to the hurricane John stirred up in Savannah when he fell for young Sophia Marty. It is bewildering how a man of 34 years old and a priest on the best can fall for a young 70-year-old girl, a pretty lass, who glances in his direction. They met on the ship, he tutored her, and they fell in love. Um, but uh, after passing loss, he worried and decided that they should probably should not marry. He thought that somehow he might lose his salvation if he would. And, and so, so he decided to tell Sophie that they would remain together forever. Never marry. She, she accepted it reluctantly, but it was taken aback when he said, We shall be eunuchs for the Lord. <laughs> yes, how could a girl take that to me? Her ex, her uh, end of the bargain expired on the sword. He was engaged the very next day to a man, Mr. Williamson, a man John described, uh, not known for his handsomeness, his wit, his, his intelligence, and least of all, his character. Goodness, the most ungifted man in America. <laughs> yes, indeed he was, according to John. Um, three days later, Sophie and Mr. Williamson tied the matter from knot, and John was undone. Oh, uh, he made a fatal mistake. He was presiding over Holy Communion on Sunday. Mr. and Mrs. Williamson stepped forward to receive the sacrament. John stood and refused to serve her, citing her unconfessed sins. Embarrassed beyond repair, she and her husband left the church and went to her uncle, who was a judge. 
he brought he over, brought John up on 13 trumped up charges. Uh, he was brought before that judge several times, but was not allowed to defend himself. Eventually, John escaped into the night, a common fugitive, and returned to England. So, how long were you two in America? John was there two and a half years. So we are not even one. Um, uh, I, I was assigned by General Oglethorpe that I sat in Fort Frederick. Uh, I tell you, those people were half beasts and half devils. Uh, if I live a hundred years, they were creatures, they were savages. Uh, I, um, I felt compelled to address their transmissions from the pulpit, but after everybody defending the sermon, they slipped over and removed a piece of my furniture from the parsonage. After a few Sundays only, my house lay as bad as that in the evil hall. I stood in the pulpit asked, please, with someone who stole my bed, please were turned, lost the decline there. And nevertheless, in every adversity that lies at my heart, I learned that I did not need a bed to get a good night's sleep. In fact, 12 years later, when I posed my Sally, she had made a list of things she insisted on I must meet before she would marry me. For one, I must stop sleeping in street clothes and start sleeping uh, uh, in pajamas. Another was, she insisted I change my knickers every day. A waste of soap, I thought. And still do. <laughs> and, and she insisted I stop sleeping on the floor and start sleeping in the bed. Um, teaching old dog tricks is not easy. Unless the old dog's trainer is a beautiful woman. Well, he certainly didn't have to train you to hills. Nay, I had been composing hymns, composing poetry since I was youth, but I made my first hymn, Christian Song on. Which Sunday? It was November, no, May 20th, 1738. Uh, you, you call it Pentecost. I was suffering from fluorosis and lying in bed and the hall was spray. And um, as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard someone say, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise. Thou shalt be healed of all thy infirmities. Yes, that's it. That's what I heard when I spoke those words. I said, who said them? A maid timidly presented herself. She apologized for her. I was a clergyman, and she was nearly a servant. But her words were lost, and she was as unlikely to office. On the spot, I gave my life to Christ, and my strength returned. Uh, my first thought was of finding my brother John, and telling him my good news. Little, though, did I know, only four days later, John, in a little Moravian society meeting in London on Aldersby Street, also met the Lord. Uh, a man was reading from Martin Luther's preface to the Romans. Uh, John said this, I shall never forget. About a quarter before nine, uh, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart. Strangely warned. I felt I didn't trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me he had forgiven my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I then testified, said he, openly to all their gathered what I felt in my heart. My brother and I were searching for one another. Uh, when finally we met, simultaneously we cried, I believe. It was at that moment God gave me the words to my first hymn. Where shall my wandering soul begin? How shall I all a smile, a slave redeemed from death and sin, a brand plucked from eternal fire. How shall I equal 
will triumph praise for sing my great deliverance praise oh how shall I the goodness tell other which thou to me hast shown that I a child of wrath and hell I should be more a child of God should know should feel my sin for him blessed with this sweet foretaste of hell. After Aldersgate, John sailed to Germany to spend some time with the Moravians. He said it was like dwelling in heaven among the citizens of heaven. Their lives bore witness to their beliefs, and yet after he returned to England, he still suffered seasons of doubt. John asked one of our Moravian brethren if uh, he should not refrain from preaching when he felt such doubts. His name was Peter Burrow. And Peter cried, and they keep preaching faith until you have it. And because you have it, you shall preach it. Don found that advice strange, but he found it to be true. One afternoon, by chance, uh, John and Peter met on the streets of London. Uh, and he said, praise the Lord, brother Peter. And Peter cried, praise the Lord. And indeed, if I had a thousand tongues, I would praise the Lord with them all. And from that chance encounter, God gave me this hymn. I should sing for you. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace, the triumphs of the triumphs of His grace, the triumphs of his grace, my gracious Master and my God, assist me and my praise words singing. Yes, oh, where am I? <laughs> me too, don't go to truth, let the little hindrance stand in your way to spread through all the earth. Uh, this is 
treasure first. <laughs> the honors of his honors of his day. Yes, the honors of his day. The honors of his day. Now I sang the verses too, but John uh, imperfectly just like it in. And he told stop. He said, no, no, no. Now, you may not realize, I wrote only the words, you know, the lyrics, John, uh, and I picked out tunes that were existing, and we, we sang my words to those lyrics, and that particular tune was named Lingam. John didn't like it. He thought it was um, too complicated that ordinary people wouldn't sing it, and he suggested I use a different tune called Asmon. Oh. For the life of me, I did not know what he was thinking. Well, hear my meaning, okay? Where are you? Yes. Uh, listen to this. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing My great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King the triumphs of his grace, my grace is flowing on and on, and I said, oh, no, no, stop, heaven's enough. If I were to leave congregations in that, they would fall asleep before I, they sang my 22 verses. Not yet, Bill No, let's sing it. Yes, okay. I advise him to trust me. <laughs> we were going to do it my way since I was the composer. And I said, it's all Lingham. Now, it is, brother. Lingham number two. There we go. Good enough. That bids our sorrow cease. That bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health, Tis life and health and peace. Tis life and health and peace. Tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the powerless clean. His blood avails. His blood avails for me. His blood avails for me. His blood avails for me. And listening to his voice, no life the dead receive, no life the dead receive. The mournful broken heart rejoice, the humble, the humble poor believe, the humble poor believe. preach the lame and would, it, would leap for joy when we pray for them, if our faith were that strong. Perhaps John and I were too methodical, too, too Methodist in our ways. Hey Charles, where did the word Methodist come from? Oh, I may not have explained that and you may not know. Um, 
It was not our choice in the beginning. Uh, at Oxford, when we were students, we designed to be downright Bible Christians. And so I formed the Holy Club. It was a group of ministerial students. We prayed together, we were in the class together. We did everything as a single entity. The underclassmen saw us coming and going, and they hooted in the region. They said, there goes another group of Methodists, but those silly Methodists. Well, at first John was offended, but um, finally he decided to defeat our critics by joining them. And so he called us the Methodists. And now those silly Methodists are everywhere. <laughs> and yet, even to this day, they are not welcome in our own Anglican church. Shortly after our conversions, uh, John asked the rector of St. Lawrence Church if he might preach them. He agreed, and John preached to the congregants and implored them, urging them to accept Christ as their Savior. Afterwards, the priest told John he would never preach there again. Uh, I got the same rejection. Suffered it everywhere we preached. We were, brain, uh, we were branded methodistically mad. Uh, we were branded enthusiastic with all manner of terrible things. The Archbishop uh, accused me of stirring up fervor uh, and thought uh, threatened to uh, excommunicate me. Briefly, my fear that a tempest returned, and I told John, but John said, face your fears. said, uh, fears him, stir up courage, right to all hills. And so I did. Uh, I um, uh, got charges with preaching to the unreached, and yet our own church would prevent us from doing that. But we had to decide which would we, which would we obey, the voice of man or of God. My, method, my Methodistical brother, he is so funny. He, um, as I composed hymns, he composed rules. <laughs> Listen to these. He composed seven rules for singing. Here it is. Rule number one. Sing these tunes before you learn any other. After that, learn as many as you please. You know, there are many strange tunes floating around out there. Uh, rule number two, he said, sing these exactly as they are printed. Uh, you will learn other tunes, unlearn them as soon as possible. Oh yes, we all know how difficult it is to unlearn tunes. Rule number three, sing all the verses that are not really this hinder you. If singing is a cross, Take it up, and you will find it a blessing. Rule number four, sing lustily and with good courage, he said. Beware of singing if you are half dead or half asleep. You must have been thinking of our Anglican friends when you wrote that one. <laughs> uh, sing proudly, he said, as you did back when you sang the songs of Satan. Rule number five, sing modestly, modestly. Do not fall, do not sing be heard above the others. He said, um, um, you know, Methodism has no room for prima donnas. Uh, and, and rule number six, sing in time, not a run in front of others nor lag behind. And above all, John wrote, sing spiritually. Aim at pleasing God more than yourself or any other creature. In Bristol, <laughs> uh, the uh, Methodists sang so lustily that they were thrown into prison. <laughs> for disturbing the peace. <laughs> and then uh, at midnight they were released for the same reason. Their cellmates couldn't uh, sleep off their hangovers. <laughs> to God be the glory. <laughs> Charles, many people believe that you wrote words of tunes that were famous drinking songs. Oh, yes. Can that be true? No, no, that's not true. Uh, but it, it, it is once. Um, I've heard that rumor. Actually, only once did I. In a seacoast town, I was preaching a series of meetings, and nightly a group of, of privateers, um, drunk sailors, burst in and started uh, erupting our meeting, singing a bawdy drinking song. It's called Nancy Dawson. Oh, it was horrible. Well, let, me, let me give you an example. <laughs> Of all the damsels in our town, the black, the fair, the red, the brown, who dance and prance and up and down, there's none like Nancy Dawson. Her comely face, her shape so neat, she dances, trips, and looks so sweet, her every movement so complete. 
I died for Nancy Dawson. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> no, that was a little scandalous. So how did you deal with that problem? Oh, uh, yes, I designed to lay a trap. Uh, I wrote hastily words to that earth or two, oh, and I taught them to the congregation. Uh, the next evening, Satan's revelers returned, and the saints were ready. We drowned out their choir singing this. Enlisted in the cause of sin, why should the good be evil? Music, alas, too long has been employed to serve the devil. For drunkenness and lewd display, he to the souls a new way. His broad and strong with clouds away, down to eternal ruin. And Satan's soldiers beat a hasty retreat. Nevertheless, John declined to include that masterpiece in our hymnals. Um, but many others did. Uh, I read scriptures, and, and um, hymns come to my heart uh, unexpectedly. For example, I read in Genesis where Jacob wrestled with the angel all night, uh, just as John and I struggled for years, and finally we surrendered, and God won. And I uh, and said words to that uh, old Scottish tune, he banks and braids upon you. And sing it with me, you should know it. Come, O thou traveler, unknown, home still I hope and cannot see my come. Money before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay and rest until the break of day. With thee all night I mean to stay and rest until the break of day. Tell me who I am, my misery, for sin declare thyself, has called me by my name, look on my hand and read in them, but who I ask thee, who art thou, tell me thy name, and tell me now, but who I ask thee, who art thou, tell me thy name, and tell me now. Yield to me now, for I am weak, but confident in self-despair. Speak to my heart in blessing, speak, be conquered by my instant prayer. Speak, O thou never hence shall move, and tell me if thy name is Speak, O thou never then shall move, and tell me if thy name is loved. Tis love, tis love. Thou diest for me, I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee, for you never so love thou art. To me, to all thy mercies move, 
thy name is loved to me. To my mercy shall I be moved. Thy nature and thy name is loved to me. To my mercy shall I be moved. Tell you many times we wrestled with devils of all matter. No, not yet, thank you. Wondering how our lives were worth an hour's purchase. After months of persecution, persecution John, I lamented to John, John, oh, if only the Lord made me, gave me wings, I would fly. And John said, if the Lord told me to fly, I would trust him for the wings. John was preaching in a home. Uh, which became surrounded by a mindless mob. Uh, it, it, he was, they were beating on the door and shouting, bring out that mattress, hand over the mattress. Uh, it was terrifying. Uh, as the door gave way, yes, that's what she said. <laughs> she said, hide, Mr. Wesley, hide. John replied, nay, I always face mine enemies. I still recall the power. John stepped out into their midst, and he stood among them, and he walked forward. He interrogated them. He said, which of you have I harmed? You or you? Jacob, Butler, have I offended you in a way which I do not recall? Each of them shrank back in terror, and uh, they didn't say it. They said nothing. And then John, John cried, will you let me speak? And one of them said, yes, let him speak. And so John preached to the very beast who would come to bite off our heads and not to have on our heads to say, oh. On another occasion, John was in a home preaching and the mob surrounded the home. Uh, the stones flew out at the time. John went outside and he stood up and preached and yet not one stone struck him in the face. It was a rarity. Afterwards, John said, the angels protected me that day. I suggested a more. Uh, practical reason. You recall John is five foot three or two. Uh, I suggested it was probably his lowness of stature. <laughs> God uses the smallest vessels uh, for his purposes. Uh, but anyway, um, John told our preacher to always stare him in the face, and uh, he has set the example. Uh, courageously, they have stood up to beggars in beggars' rags and clerical gowns, too. The resistance, the resistance I cannot describe, it has been unimaginable against the Methodists. Bishops ordered their priests to oppose Methodism at every turn, and they have. We were labeled enemies of Christianity in the news and from pulpits everywhere. At Macfort, the mob dragged John through the hair, by his hair through the mud, uh, and struck him several times in the face. Um, uh, at Winsbury, Methodists were tortured for eight continuous months. Uh, Methodist homes were torched. Uh, Methodists were beaten. Uh, Methodist mothers who were expecting children were especially targeted so that they might miscarry and never bear another Methodist. Uh, Tis a literal war we have fought with Satan himself. And I wrote this hymn. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. Who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conquerors. Standing in his great might, with all his strength and good, but take to arm you for the fight, the armor of the Lord, that have evil things done, and all your conflicts past, ye shall all come to Christ alone and send on hand at last. Stand 
standing against your foes in close and firm array. Legions of Satan seem to host throughout this evil day. But meet the sons of night, resist their vain design, up with the sword of heavenly light of righteousness divine. Jesus has died for you, what can his love withstand? Believe for fast your shield, and who shall pluck you from his hand? Believe that Jesus reigns, for power to him again. Believe to you are free from sin, believe yourself to him. Strength the strength go on, wrestle and fight and pray. Tread all the powers of darkness down and win the well from day. Still let the spirit cry, in all his soldiers come to Christ the Lord descends from high and takes his conqueror's home. To Christ the Lord descends from high and takes his conqueror's Our preachers have suffered mightily. Many were lost to illness, to persecution, to the strain of constant travel. Some, as punishment, were conscripted into the military against their will and died. Um, most of our field preachers are worn out by age 30. At annual conference, we never know which will attend and who will have gone to heaven until we call the roll. It was such a moving moment I felt compelled to write a hymn for it, an appropriate one, uh, which John opens now. Every gathering of Edel Conference, we sing this together with mixed joy and sorrow. And are we yet alive? And see it each other's face. Glory and thanks to Jesus again for his almighty grace. What troubles have we seen? What mighty conflicts? Fighting and fear within, without, and we assembled last. Yet out of all the Lord hath brought us by his love and 
Perhaps one, or two, following John through all that trouble, all those years, those hardships, I could not endure it any longer. Eventually, I married my Sally and settled down here in St. Marlborough Parish in London, uh, and I became a priest. The decision John made, which I could not abide, was ordaining his own preachers. He assumed a responsibility, a privilege reserved alone for bishops. What he was thinking was unimaginable. That, that sealed the parting of our ways. That too. One other thing. Oh, and what was that? We want to know. Oh, God fell in love. Again, um, to a, a Miss Grace Murray. Miss Murray was a, a serving woman. She was, she was one of our helpers. She was very helpful in our societies. And she was very lovely, but how shall I say, I considered her beneath John's station in life. Um, she loved him, I think, as well. But as with Miss Sophie earlier, he, he could not he could not bring himself to marry her. Uh, finally, he said, yes, they would win, but first he must, he must in ask the permission of all his preachers, uh, and that would take approximately a year. <laughs> Miss Murray was taken aback, but she reluctantly agreed um, what he was thinking. So John took over preaching, and he left her in Newcastle with one of our preachers, Mr. Mr. Murray. Mr. Bennett, and then he drove on to preach elsewhere. A couple of days later, he received a letter from two of them asking his permission for them to marry. Oh, my. <laughs> the world was first to hear John Leonard. Oh, yes. Oh, so do I, yes. John was thunderstruck. Oh, listen. For months, Grace was torn. Which should she marry, Mr. Wesley or Mr. Murray? Uh, I designed, I felt compelled to end that conflict. And so I got on my horse, I rode to Newcastle, I counseled with, with the two of them, and I pronounced them man and wife. John did not hear about it until a few days later. When he did, John was, oh, he was undone. I have never seen him like that. He was undone. Um, he, um, when I finally met, he interrogated me. Um, I thought I couldn't bear it. He, he asked me, Brother Charles, why did you, why did you marry her? And I told him my reasons, but he said, wasn't that? Uh, I told him he, he was destroying our societies. I told him he was, he was a leader, yet he was running around in the circles. What kind of an example was he? And so I, I thought, I would end it in that it was best for us all. And he said, was that really the reason, was it? Or did you love her too? And I answered that I could not answer. I only thought it best. At any rate, he forgave me, or so he said he did. He said, Brother Charles, I love you as my own life. And I told him the same. We embraced it never again will we quite so close. So did John ever get married? He did, yes. And oh, it is his worst mistake. <clears throat> to a wealthy widow, uh, he, he was walking on London Bridge, and he slipped on the ice and fell and sprained his ankle. He had not hospitals back then, and he was put up in the home of Mr. Uh, Mrs. Marnie Vazil, a wealthy widow. 
again he fell in love with her. Eight days later they married and uh, mere eight days he did not consult me for some reason, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, anyway, I would have warned him. I would have cautioned him of all women in England. She was least suited to be his helpmeet. Now, uh, anyone, anyone but uh, her. He took on a preacher, uh, riding with him when he was preaching. He got a carriage. And he said of his wife, How anyone on such a beautiful day can find so much to complain about, I know not. Listening to my wife is like tearing flesh out of my bones. Yeah, but well, she accused me of cavorting behind my Sally's back. She was evil. That marriage was predestined to fail. Come to think of it, Casey, the, the Calvinists may have a board off. No. <laughs> anyway, um, um, anyway, eventually they separated. John wrote in his journal, "My wife left me today. I neither asked her to leave, nor shall I ask her to return." <laughs> <laughs> to this day, John, now in his age, he still rides every day compulsively, travels relentlessly, preaches to the masses and the mobs and wins souls for Christ. Many times I became convinced that his Methodist movement would end, and, and many times I, he proved me wrong. He tells our preachers, press on, break through, let not a little hindrance stand in your way, and he sets the example. Clearly, my brother hears a higher voice of his commander, the Lord Jesus, marveling at his indomitable spirit. Indomitable spirit. I wrote a hymn for that purpose. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fitted for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill, oh, may it all my powers engage to do my must. Ah, may with jealous care and is thy sight to live, and do thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely. Assured if I my trust betrayed, I shall forever die. Assured if I my trust betrayed, I shall forever die. Hours late, and I have a full day tomorrow tending my flock here at uh, St. Marlebone. This parish, you know, it is good to be settled finally after all those tumultuous years. Still, still occasionally I look back, I remember those terrifying days, those thrilling days, and I admit I long for them. When my brother and I rode to the four corners of the kingdom, we preach to the masses, we brave the storm, the wind, the rain, the mindless mob, all for the Lord. You know, when one lives in such a way for years, then attempts to settle down, one never entirely succeeds. Listen, listen to me. You, especially who are yet young, you can hear the gospel preached all your life, but until you repent, until you surrender, it means little. The surest way to miss out on happiness is to chase it. But if you chase virtue instead, and you walk in God's stead and in His will, 
happiness shall likely find you. And in Christ alone can you find happiness in this life. Remember that. With to him you have not given your life completely. I urge you to this day. Some here have tarried far too long. Some tarry now. Yourself, you impoverish. Yet, when you surrender to the Lord, you lift up your hands and your heart, your self indulged interests, your life, and then your hands and your heart as they open to receive all that God would give you. And oh, so much He would give only, you would be quick to receive His treasure. Uh, hear my words, stand amazed that God calls you to be His servant while on earth. Well, ask yourself, how might you live this day so that years from now, after you are but a memory, people will still be quoting you and singing your songs? Remember that. Surely you know this one and can sing it. And can it be? That I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled Mercy, all immense and free, for oh, my God, it found out me. Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Thus found in sin and nature's night. Thine I diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dawns and flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose when up and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and gold in righteousness divine. Oh, I approach 
to close this out. Uh, I really must be off to bed. But before you leave, would you kindly put out those lights and, um, and latch the door uh, behind you? <sighs> My brother John one time said that he feared not the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in, a, in England or in America. But he, he did, did fear that they, they would, would exist, exist only as a dead sect having the form of godliness without power. And this, said he, undoubtedly would be the case, unless they hold fast to the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. Let us pray, God forbid, that never happens to the Methodists. Forth in thy name, O Lord, I go, my daily labor to pursue, the only thee resolve to know, in all I think and speak and do. For thee delightfully employ, but ere thy bounteous grace hath given, to run my course with constant joy, and closely walk with thee to heaven. The best door of all is, God is with us. Good evening. All right. You it, let's sing one more. Come on. Christ the stand. Risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say. Alleluia. Praise your choice and triumph high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. Since it's snowing outside, <laughs> let's sing a program. Of the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. And mercy, mild God, and sin is reconciled. Joyful, Lord, ye nations cry, join the triumph of the sky. With the angelic hosts of the Christ is born in Bethlehem. Of the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Now sing it like you mean it. Hail the heavenborn Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and light to all He brings. Risen with He. Sing lustily. While he lays his glory by, one that men no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give the second birth. Up the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should shine?
Yeah. 